we now discuss a second application of distributed loads. This involves an incompressible fluid at rest, a state referred to as hydrostatic pressure. The term incompressible means the density is constant. A medium's mass density is typically dependent on a number of other variables. For pure substances, water for example, it is a function of two other state variables, often pressure and temperature. If the temperature of the medium is far from its boiling temperature, and the range of pressure and temperature is not too great, it is reasonable to assume the mass density is constant. It is straightforward to show that the pressure in such a body of fluid is only a function of depth. We can show this by considering the free body diagram of a column of fluid from its surface down to depth D. Here I've sketched a column of fluid. The XYZ coordinate system is a little bit unconventional. You can see that Z is defined as down in our figure. And uh, we have pressure acting on all sides of this column of fluid. Uh, the pressure that's acting on the sides of the column is, is sketched in a different color just because it's not going to be relevant to our equilibrium in the Z direction, but it's still present uh, and it's squeezing the column from all sides. But in the Z direction, if we define Z as positive downward, then some of the forces in the Z direction will give us that we have the weight plus the pressure at the top of the fluid times the cross-sectional area of the column minus the pressure at the bottom times the cross-sectional area of the column is equal to zero. Now the weight will be the specific weight of the fluid times its volume. The specific weight is the mass density rho, which we're taking as constant, times g times the volume of fluid, which is the cross-sectional area of the column, times d. And so you can see that we've got a common cross-sectional area that's going to cancel out there, and if we move the pressure over to the right-hand side, the pressure as a function of depth is equal to the reference pressure at the top plus rho g d. That is, we have pressure as a function of depth, which is just a linear function. There are several points to make about this expression. The pressure at the surface of the fluid is a reference pressure P0. At atmospheric temperature and altitude near sea level, P0 is ambient air pressure and is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. When pressure is written this way, including the reference pressure, it is called absolute pressure. Although absolute pressure is needed in some applications, we don't need it for structural problems because it acts around the entire body. It is not the absolute pressure, but differences in pressure that result in structural loading. For this reason, we often neglect the reference pressure and just report the hydrostatic pressure as P as a function of D equals rho G D and that is called gauge pressure. Second, pressure acts normal to all surfaces simultaneously. In our free body diagram of the column, note that pressure acts on and is normal to all four sides of the column in addition to the top and bottom. This feature of pressure is often a source of confusion when drawing free body diagrams. Hydrostatic pressure is only a function of depth but it is always to be drawn as acting normal to a submerged surface. The icons in the middle of the submerged fluid in this figure are meant to convey this feature. Changing the orientation of the icon at constant depth doesn't change the pressure, but the force acting on each face remains pressure times area and normal to the face no matter how the orientation changes. Third, the spatial dependence of the hydrostatic pressure is only in the direction of depth. It does not matter how expansive the body of fluid is. If you are swimming and go underneath the surface, the pressure you feel depends only on how deep you dive. A depth of a few meters in an Olympic pool is indistinguishable from a depth of a few meters in the Pacific Ocean. Before continuing, we should also say something about the need for the fluid to be at rest. If the validity of this expression depended on the fluid being absolutely still, it wouldn't have much use. So the question is, how still does the fluid need to be for us to be able to use 
the hydrostatic pressure expression. It turns out that when you treat pressure more generally, you can write total pressure as the sum of two terms, static pressure and dynamic pressure. The static pressure is the pressure associated with the stationary medium and would be our hydrostatic pressure. The dynamic pressure depends on the speed of the fluid and the expression for total pressure can be written as the sum of the static and dynamic pressure. I'll just write the static pressure as P since we're using that for our hydrostatic pressure. And the dynamic pressure looks like this. It's one half mass density times velocity squared. For those of you who have taken a physics course, that second term looks a lot like particle kinetic energy with the mass replaced by mass density. We can think of the dynamic pressure as a kinetic energy density, and our hydrostatic pressure equation is valid as long as the dynamic pressure is small compared to the static pressure, or as long as the ratio of dynamic pressure to static pressure is much less than 1. The mass density will cancel out here, so we'll end up with v squared over 2g times depth having to be much less than 1. Now let's think about this ratio using modest currents and depths in SI units. Suppose I was in a body of water experiencing currents on the order of 1 meter per second, and at a depth on the order of 1 meter. Since we are using SI units and these calculations are approximate, I'll take G to be about 10 meters per second squared. Then this ratio is equal to 1 20th, which is in fact much less than 1. This tells us the expression for hydrostatic pressure is valid in lakes or oceans where we are typically looking at modest currents at significant depths. It is not valid for water moving at high speed at shallow depths like the white water conditions we would experience in mountain rivers. The main features of our expression for hydrostatic pressure are summarized in this slide. Again, one of the main points that frequently trips up students in problem solving is that the pressure is a function of depth, but the orientation of the pressure is always normal to the submerged surface. A state of hydrostatic pressure is important for another reason. For many applications involving structural metals, a state of hydrostatic pressure does not induce material failure, no matter how large the pressure becomes. It is pressure differences or pressure gradients that are structurally dangerous, not the absolute pressure itself. To make this point, consider the case of the Titanic. Any shipwreck will do, actually, but the Titanic figures prominently in U.S. history, and the relatively recent James Cameron picture provides computer-generated rendering of the spectacular disaster that was the sinking of the ship. We know that the unique features of the Titanic's design, along with the way it hit the iceberg, resulted in it tearing itself apart on the surface of the Atlantic. But here's the part I want you to think about. Once the big section started drifting towards the bottom of the ocean, what didn't happen? The pieces didn't crumple into much smaller volumes, despite the presence of what human beings would consider to be crushing pressure. Why is that? The state of hydrostatic pressure doesn't produce any tearing motion along any plane of orientation within the solid. It is unaffected by this state. By comparison, a submarine has to accommodate mere mortals in its interior. On the inside, the pressure has to be sea level atmospheric pressure, or approximately that. On the outside, the pressure is enormous. The pressure difference between outside and inside creates a very real danger and is the reason submarines can't venture below certain depths. Many navies, including the U.S. Navy, have lost submarines that, for one reason or another, drop below a critical depth, resulting in a buckling of the hull and a destruction of the vessel. 
With that cheery thought, we now turn our attention to the solution of some problems involving hydrostatic pressure. Note again that the coordinate system shown in the figure is a bit unconventional. The x-coordinate in the middle and right figures is coming out of the page, y is to the left, and z is down. z is positive in the direction of increasing depth. We will mostly use a conventional x-y coordinate system when writing equilibrium equations based on free body diagrams, but for now I'll discuss these problems in the context of the coordinate system shown in this figure. The flat plate shown in the figure has a span s in the x direction. You might wonder why we're using the term span instead of, instead of, for instance, depth or width, but we're using depth to describe the depth of the fluid from the surface, that's in the z direction, and we're using a lowercase w for line load, so instead of using width, we're going to talk about span s. Looking first at the middle figure, we see the pressure at locations a and b depends only on the depth as measured from the surface, z equals dA and z equals dB, respectively. The orientation of that pressure is normal to the plate surface. Note also that we are only showing the pressure on the upper left side of the plate. If this plate is truly submerged in a fluid, a complete picture would have the same pressure distribution on the bottom of the plate, assuming we could ignore the very slight difference in depth associated with the plate thickness. There would also be pressure acting on the top and bottom thicknesses at A and B, again normal to the surface. Because the hydrostatic pressure increases linearly with depth, we can think of the pressure distribution as the superposition of a uniform rectangular shaped load based on the pressure at A and a linearly increasing triangular shaped load based on the difference in pressure between B and A. In fact, we can turn the pressure into a line load by multiplying the pressure by the span. In this case, we would say WA is equal to the pressure at A times the span S, and the line load at B is equal to the pressure at B times the span S. Then the resultant force P1 we could write as the line load value at A times L, and the resultant force P2 is one half the difference between line loads at B and A times L. The centers of those two distributions are in the middle of the rectangle and a third of the height from the base with the triangle, just as with other similarly shaped distributions. Sometimes it may be useful to draw a free body diagram of a body of fluid adjacent to a structure, as shown in this figure C. The force P shown on the fluid is the resultant force exerted by the structure on the fluid, and there is an equal and opposite P exerted by the fluid on the structure. This P is the same resultant P from the middle figure where P equals P1 plus P2. This provides a way of inferring the resultant force exerted on the submerged structure by examining a free body diagram of a body of fluid adjacent to that structure. Why would we want to do this? In some cases it is easier to infer the resultant force P than it is to calculate it directly. This will be more obvious in the next figure. Note that the free body diagram of the body of fluid includes pressure distributions on both the top and side of the fluid, and that these distributions are normal to the fluid boundaries. The weight of the body of fluid is also included in the free body diagram. What do we do if the submerged structure isn't flat? Generally, submerged surfaces will have two principal radii of curvature, like the hull of a submarine, rounded in two planes. We will restrict our attention to a smaller set of submerged curved surfaces, namely those with only one radius of curvature in the yz plane. The structure will still be flat in the x direction. We could also say that the second radius of curvature in the xy plane is infinite. In looking at the free body diagram of the submerged surface in the middle figure, we can see right away that there is a complication with the curved surface that is absent with the flat surface. Because the orientation of the pressure is everywhere normal to the submerged surface, and because the unit normal of the curved surface is changing continuously along the surface, we now have this issue. The pressure distribution is changing 
both in magnitude and direction continuously as we move from A to B. Calculating the resultant force P directly requires that we account for both changes as we integrate along the arc length of the surface. Here, the alternative shown on the right is easier. A free body diagram of the body of fluid includes pressure distributions on its top and side boundaries. If those boundaries are simple, horizontal, and vertical boundaries, then the top boundary has a uniform pressure distribution and the side boundary has a linearly increasing pressure distribution and the orientation of both distributions is not changing along those boundaries. It is much easier to calculate these resultant forces than it is to perform the complicated integration implied by the middle figure. We still have to include the weight of the body of the fluid, but this is still often easier than the complicated pressure interval. We now take a look at a few examples to contrast solution procedures. This example involves the loads experienced by braces as poured concrete sets. We are treating the concrete as a fluid with mass density 2400 kilograms per cubic meter. We are told there are braces for every 1.2 meters of form length. This will enable us to treat this as a planar problem with span S equals 1.2 meters. We are also told to treat all the connections as pins so there will be only force reactions and BH and EI will both be two force members. In this first example, we will calculate the force carried by brace BH and then look at brace EI in a subsequent example. Let's begin with a free body diagram of form AC. In this case, our enveloping surface looks like this. And if we draw the free body diagram for that left hand side, we have force reactions AX and AY at the bottom. We're treating this as pin support. We have uh, on the left hand side, we're treating BH as a, a two force member and uh, we have a, an angle of 35 degrees here. We also have our pressure distribution, which begins from atmospheric pressure, zero essentially at the top, and then peaks at the bottom. So we have a purely triangular distribution now. And this will be the line load at A, which will be equal to the pressure at A times the span S. The line load at A is equal to the pressure at A times S, which is rho G times the depth at A times S. And that's going to be equal to 2,400 kilograms per cubic meter times 9.81 meters per second squared. The depth at A is 3 meters, and the span is 1.2 meters. And if we calculate that value, we get the line load at A is equal to 8.476 times 10 to the fourth newtons per meter. The resultant load from the pressure then for this triangular distribution is just one half the base times the height of that triangle. And that turns out to be 127.1 kilonewtons. We can now modify our free body diagram to replace the distributed load with the equivalent load acting at its effective center. Now we can find the load taken by member BH by just taking moment equilibrium about A. The vertical component of BH will have no moment arm, but the horizontal component will. So we have P times 1 meter minus FBH sine 35 degrees times 2 meters equals 0. And if we just solve, then we get FBH is equal to P over 2 sine 35 degrees. And for P equal 127.1 kilonewtons, 
this number turns out to be equal to 110.8 kilonewtons.